Hello class and welcome to our study that continues in the epistles written by Paul. We're now going to enter the four letter group called the Christological group and I trust that as we study this and better understand what Paul was teaching because we understand the situation he's speaking from in each of these four letters, that indeed it will be a message that draws us all into humility as Shecky's world is encouraging us here. Let's open this session in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you that we have this treasure to study, that, Father, we might discover more about you and the message you give to us through Paul um, during these next few weeks. And we just ask that you'll continue to bless each of the students as they continue to develop and they acquire more information that it might be glorifying to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and amen. The Christological group, meaning uh, those who are explaining the role of the Christ. Many people speak of a personal relationship with Jesus, and indeed uh, that is what uh, we are told to seek. But before we can appreciate our friend in Jesus, we must understand the position of the Christ. This is also called the prison epistles, as it is understood that they were each written while Paul was in prison in Rome. It could also be called the prison epistles because of the way Paul described himself in Ephesians 3, 1. He calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Clearly, he is saying that the Romans are not the ones that have imprisoned him. Man is not uh, responsible for why he's in prison. It's by the permissive will of Jesus Christ himself. And that's exactly where Christ uh, wants Paul to be. Uh, that's where he wants to have an influence on the Roman Empire. And Paul is more than pleased to accommodate um, Jesus in this request. So in this uh, group of epistles, we're going to be studying the letter that was written to the church of Coloss, also to one of the lead members of the church at Coloss, Philemon, will receive a letter and a neighboring church, the church at Ephesus, and not too far away, um, the church of Philippi. The letters of Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians were all delivered at the same time, carried by one person, and they are indeed connected, as we'll indicate in our study. Philippians was issued near to the end of Paul's imprisonment as he was shown his anxiety or his joy in knowing that his release was coming very soon from, as we understand it, Rome. So when we consider the date and the location of the Christological books, we believe all four epistles were most likely issued during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. We'll talk more about that later on, but we have come to understand that Paul had more than one imprisonment in Rome. The first one was uh, not nearly as stressful or as limiting, and that's the time where Paul was able to write these epistles. Acts records no significant imprisonment that could have occurred prior to Paul's arrest at Jerusalem. Now, some argue concerning imprisonment at Caesarea as an alternative to Rome. This discussion is possible when considering alone the mention of the praetorium, uh, Caesar's household. That's a statement that could possibly suit Caesarea Maritime, located on the uh, Mediterranean Sea uh, in Israel. However, our uh, author of our text, Hebert, strongly dismisses this possibility, and he talks about it in detail in chapters uh, two, in verse pages 206 through 211. So uh, if I were to summarize those pages, um, it would more or less say um, it's true that there was a praetorium 
located at Caesarea Maritime. There was a prison at Caesarea Maritime. It's true that Paul, if he got arrested um, because of his action associated with going to Jerusalem, if you remember, that's the way we wrapped up our study in uh, Romans, was Paul was asking, one of the purposes of the letter, the two objectives was Paul was asking the people at the Church of Rome to pray that when he delivered the collection to the saints in Jerusalem, that that would go well, because he knew that the Judaizers would be laying in wait for him there. Hebert is of the opinion, and I agree, that it was at that occasion where he went to Jerusalem is where he was accused that he was uh, deemed that it was necessary for him to be imprisoned. And in that imprisonment, Paul appealed to Caesar. And even we know even Agrippa uh, made comments about that. I'd let him go if it wasn't for him appealing to Caesar. So even if Paul was... Uh, spending his prison time in Rome. He had to go through Caesarea Maritime. So he spent time in Caesarea Maritime, I think, as he was waiting on a ship to go to Rome. But as Hebert will point out during the study of uh, the rest of these books, um, he certainly believes that the long-term imprisonment was at Rome because it was a custom there that if people had a means of... Uh, affording it, or they had a pay source, um, they would uh, reduce the number of people in the formal prison by putting them on a house arrest if they could pay for a guard to watch them, and they had a means to pay for the rent to stay in that house. It was a win-win. The prisoner, if he was nonviolent, um, had a more comfortable setting while he was waiting trial, while the state, or in this case the Roman government, uh, would not have the cost of housing and keeping a prisoner. So when we consider these things, uh, the best application uh, for Caesar's household in the Praetorium Guard is best explained by saying Paul was in Rome, not in Caesarea Maritime during his imprisonment. There's no mention of Philip the Evangelist. If he would have been located um, in prison further to the east, um, it seems as Philip and his activities would have been mentioned, but um, he was silent regarding Philip. This also best fits um, Onesimus, as we study in Philemon. Onesimus is the slave that fled from his owner, Philemon. Is, does it make sense uh, that when Onesimus fled and he ended up with Paul, would he really run to a Roman prison in Israel? Would he run to a prison to hide that was so close to uh, the city that he was fleeing from, which was Colossus? I think not. It would have made more sense for a slave that was seeking freedom or to get lost in the masses of people to go to Rome, much farther away, uh, much easier to blend into the populace there. Uh, the location of Rome best allows for Paul's co-workers to assist him in the preaching, again, as I described the understanding of the house rest in Rome for uh, Roman citizens. It best matches the decisive nature of Paul's trial. Uh, throughout these books, uh, Paul is talking about his imminent release and how he's looking forward to uh, being able to get back with everybody. And I know that it's coming soon. Well, that would not be the case if he's appealed to Caesar and he was in another prison. There would still be another appeal process. So he's saying that he's close to the end of his appeals and he knows that he is uh, he's going to have the opportunity to come back and visit the churches, pray that it happens soon. And then another uh, topic that uh, we re referred to in Romans was that uh, Paul was wanting the church in Rome to assist him in his Western campaign of evangelism, specifically going to Spain. All of a sudden, Spain's not mentioned 
uh, in this book as we look at the books in chronological order. And it was probably not mentioned because uh, Paul has been in prison for so long uh, of a period of time that the attention now has gone back to the east because there were problems coming up, such as the problems uh, at the church of Colosh. So uh, that explains why uh, we don't hear any mention of Spain. Um, he needs to go back to his eastern churches, help them in getting some doctrinal matters uh, corrected, then he could uh, focus his attention more toward the West. So that brings us to the study of the first book, the church at Coloss, um, rejoicing in the supremacy of Christ in all things, and specifically, and you will hear this a lot, and this is the theme of Colossians, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Now this contrasts with the book of Ephesians, where he refers to uh, the church is the body of Christ. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks, but for this study, I want to draw attention to the fact that the main theme is if we're going to solve any type of problems, if we're going to uh, clarify any theological or moral error, we need to revert back to Christ as the head of the church. Christ is the supremacy and the sufficiency of the church and all things. So, Christ is the antidote not only for theological error, but for moral error as well. A true apprehension of the person and the work of Christ manifests itself in ethical living, as our author says in page 226. Now, let me say it in my own words. There are times where we feel that we have a gray area and we're not sure what to do or how to address an issue. If we will continue to see everything from the perspective of Christ is the head of the church, I am a member of that church, and if Christ is the head, then what am I to do in this situation? And whatever the question is, it will become more clear when we recognize what glorifies the head? What would the head, Christ, have us do? There are many uh, archaeological uh, digs and remains exposed of Coloss, and it is a wonderfully preserved city in modern-day Turkey. It is located to the east of the Aegean Sea along what's uh, called the Lycos Valley, the Lycos River, which feeds into the Meander River, which goes into um, the Aegean Sea. More specifically, if you're looking about 200 miles east or southeast of Ephesus, which is located on the Aegean Sea, you'll see uh, Colossus, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Now, these uh, cities were very close to each other, and they show up in the Bible, um, especially Laodicea and Hierapolis later on. Uh, specifically, uh, it's, uh, Laodicea is mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In ancient uh, Coloss, you see the ancient remains of some of the buildings and uh, theaters that were there. The Most of the damage was caused by earthquakes um, centered around before and after the time of Christ. But even though there are, all those damages have occurred, uh, there are some marvelous uh, remains. On the top right hand corner you see an aqueduct system that would either be carrying hot water or cold water. Now that may ring a bell and be a reminder to you to the message that um, John was told to deliver to the church at Laodicea, if you remember that. At Hierapolis, there um, are wonderful, uh, warm flowing rivers that have uh, hot water springs that have high levels of minerals in them and are considered 
to be healing minerals. They are considered to be highly therapeutic and valuable. So at Hierapolis, um, which is to the northwest of Laodicea, you have these um, wonderful hot water springs. And if you look at the picture on the left, it looks like a glacier, but it's not. It's actually um, dissolved uh, calcium carbonate that has set up. And um, it looks like a glacier. If you look closely, there are people walking on it. And uh, there it's, it's warm weather. The piping system and the conduit is what's shown on the right. Now, as I have alluded to, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, um, Laodicea was warned, I would rather you be hot or cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. That sickens me. It makes me want to vomit, spit you out of my mouth. Um, I like helping people with this illustration, though. If you think of hot water and cold water illustrations, hot water is desirable and useful. A hot cup of coffee, a hot cup of, of tea, hot water to soak sore muscles in or to take a hot bath. But at the same time, cold water uh, is good. It's refreshing. It's cool. Again, it could be used for swelling. Um, there is nothing wrong with being cold. Uh, there are lots of uh, messages that's been preached that I would rather have you either hot or cold, turning it into uh, either hot emotions for me or become cold toward me. And that really doesn't make sense. Why would a loving God want his people to be cold toward him? And I understand the metaphor. If somebody is really against God, then really be strongly against him. And at least that way, everybody knows where you stand. And don't be um, half hot or half cold uh, because, you know, you need to decide. But that's really not what the Laodiceans would have understood. The Laodiceans, they envied the hot water that was available at Hierapolis. They found hot water as being valuable. At the same time, to the uh, south of them was glacial waters up in the mountains, and they were cold, refreshing waters, and they considered the cold, refreshing waters to be desirable too. But the problem was the aqueduct systems that carried the hot water and carried the cold water, by the time both of them got there, they had become lukewarm, the minerals had dropped out, and the water was yucky. So that's the meaning of, I would rather you have a hot water ministry, or I'd rather you have a cold water ministry. Just pick your ministry, get active in ministry, but don't be lukewarm without being uh, specifically committed to anything. Uh, that doesn't work. Get out of the pew, get active in a ministry. There are lots of different ministries. Some are hot water, some are cold water, but get active. And he said, uh, if that doesn't happen, then you could lose your candlestick or your influence of the Holy Spirit in your church. So keep in mind, when, when you're looking at metaphors in the Bible, um, there are many benefits and misgivings to metaphor. The benefits include... Uh, a, an illustration like this adds color, simplicity, duality. Um, it's uh, easy to retain. It can cross cultural boundaries. But at the same time, uh, if misunderstood, there can be a possible distraction, focus on the minor instead of the major, like talking about what hot and cold means rather than talking about ministry. Uh, it could be a misapplication. And in different cultures, and metaphors can possibly mean something different. Now, on to Coloss. The city is located at a strategic spot um, on an important highway from Ephesus toward the east that eventually tied into the Silk Highway. Uh, at this point, the Lycus Valley is about 10 miles long. It's less than 2 miles wide. And Laodicea is located about 12 miles away from Coloss. Laodicea was a thriving business center, also strategically located along the highway, and it was a great city of wealth and 
to the south of it was Mount Cadmus, uh, where the uh, glaciers could be found, and it was also known as an important banking center. Now, Hierapolis, again, the one that had the hot water springs, is located about six miles north of Laodicea across the Lycus Valley, and it was known for its hot mineral springs and famous health resorts associated with that. All three cities were close together and could easily be walked, visited uh, within a day. The Lycus Valley is known to be a rich, fertile soil, and the sheep that were raised there were classic as they had a glossy black wool, which was highly desirable. Uh, they had that because of the rich minerals and the grasses that they would eat and the water they would drink. All three cities had considerable Jewish populations, and at the time of Paul's epistle, Colossus had already lost its formal prominence to neighboring cities. Coloss was by far the least significant church receiving an epistle from Paul. The reason that uh, it was diminishing was because later on, by the time Paul wrote this epistle, later on the highway was relocated and more of an emphasis was placed upon Laodicea as opposed to Coloss. The church was started by uh, a man recognized as Epaphras. Epaphras was a native of Coloss. He was recognized as Paul's representative, thereby justifying Paul claiming the Colossians were his own charges. Uh, Epaphras' work was most likely an outgrowth of Paul's three years of labor in Ephesus, which wasn't that far away, uh, roughly 200 miles away. Uh, nothing indicates the size of the church, but it was likely small as the Romans rerouted the main road to go through Laodicea. From Philemon 2, which we'll be studying later, it is seen that the house of Philemon was the center of the assembly. They met in Philemon's house. The membership was mostly Gentile, and after this epistle, the church virtually disappears. But we don't hear anything about them. The Church of Colossus was established during Paul's three-year ministry at Ephesus. So again, Epaphras would have been evangelized by Paul, and he would have gone out and started uh, his own churches, and most likely that's what happened there at Colossus. But uh, he was also uh, assisting at Hierapolis and Laodicea over a five- to six-year period um, and prior to the writing of this epistle to Colossus, and he continued in that role afterwards, as we understand. Now, recently, an insidious error had begun at the church of Colossus, and Epaphras just wasn't capable of addressing the problem. Uh, so he goes to Paul looking for assistance. Let me see that in chapter 1. Now, Epaphras' report included... The church was stable, it was grown in grace. They had a loyal affection to Paul. However, they also had a problem. Somebody has come in and started a new teaching that was misinformed concerning the mystery of the role of Jesus as the Christ. So, we may not know the details of what the accusation was or what the flawed teaching was, but was, as we look at the theology, the doctrines, of Christ that are taught, it's clear to see that there was somebody attacking the position of Christ. Now, the occasion for Colossians was twofold. The primary reason was, and we'll talk about this more next week, but Onesimus, who was the slave of Philemon, he fled from Philemon because of something that he had done wrong, and somehow he ended up with Paul. Now, he's known of Paul um, from the teaching and Epaphras talking about it. Remember, this church is not that big. Onesimus is the slave in Philemon's house, and how that house is where the church met. So this has to be addressed. Onesimus is with Paul while he's writing this letter, and he's going to be telling Onesimus he needs to go back to Philemon. But at the same time, he's going to address Item number two, the second reason was um, Epaphras was uh, quite concerned and what he told Paul was troubling to Paul and Paul felt like this demanded a letter to be issued to clarify some doctrinal error. Since Philemon 22 indicates that Paul's appeal to Caesar has not yet been taken up, 
The letter is likely sent in the summer of 62. Now, the carrier of the letter is Tychicus, and he's a native of Asia, and he accompanied Onesimus, most likely so that Onesimus would be less likely to get arrested as a runaway slave as he returned to Colossus. Since uh, Philemon 23 refers to Epaphras as my fellow prisoner, he was likely detained with Paul in a temporary confinement by the authorities. The purpose of Colossians? Stabilization. Writing to strengthen and confirm the adherence of the gospel. While Paul has never met them, he's never been to Colossians, he has a deep concern for them, and he wants this church to be stabilized. He also wants to crush the heretical teaching of apparently a single teacher. It is difficult to know exactly what that heresy is that's being taught, but we're going to take a, an effort to do that in our next slide. Um, the root of the error lies in an inadequate and erroneous view of the person and work of Christ, undermining the sufficiency of his redemption. Thirdly, the purpose is instruction in a well-rounded Christian life based on a true apprehension of and a vital union with Christ the head, Christ the head. And remember, Christ is the antidote not only for theological error, but for moral, moral error as well. A true apprehension of the person and the work of Jesus Christ in that position manifests itself in ethical living. Purpose, I'm sorry, the heresy at Coloss is not specified, but the basis of Paul's instruction addresses the deity of Christ. This matter is similar to what eventually become known as Gnosticism, or at least that's what um, our author believes. He believes that Gnosticism, which is a, a form of the word knowledge, um, is based upon this. God is good and matter is evil. Well, it's true. God is good and matter, as far as it being part of creation, has been cursed after the Garden of Eden. That's true. But then they take it one step further. They say, well, if Jesus was human and he's made up of matter, he has a physical body, he could not be fully God. Therefore, Jesus Christ was one of the emanations sent out descending from God. He was a man, and he was sent from God, no doubt about that. But because he was a created thing, he has his limitations. Therefore, they're saying, to really understand who God is and what he meant when he sent Jesus, there is a secret higher knowledge it's higher than the words of Jesus that's necessary for enlightenment and salvation. And I just got to tell you guys, this can go so far. It, it gets into channeling, it gets into seance, it gets into um, people who sacrifice themselves or do special things to be found warranted of God channeling through them and giving special messages. <coughs> It is essentially the basis of many false religions that acknowledge that the Bible, the King James Bible, is a good Bible. Jesus was a good man, and we should benefit from those things. But there are things such as church tradition that God has also used, and God still uses individuals to give further enlightenment. Uh, you can talk about Joseph Smith. You could talk about Muhammad. Uh, you could talk about uh, the Pope. There are many people who take a play off of this concept and say that God is still giving supernatural information. You want to be around the people who are in the know. Well, clearly Paul attacks that uh, severely. And if we look at an outline of the book of Colossians, he starts off in the chapter by reminding who our Christ is. He doesn't say God created. He points out that Christ is the creator. Christ is the one in charge of the church, and Christ is the one in charge of our ministry. Christ is in charge of our walk. 
Christ is in charge of our salvation, and Christ is the one that makes us grow. In the first chapter, it's pure instruction. But then in chapter 2, he makes it personal. And beware, you better recognize that Christ is indeed expecting these things, and, and we are to walk it, we are to talk it, and we are expected to grow in Christ, grow in Christ, and nothing else will do. When we get into chapter 3, we talk about how this affects our life, our mind, our body, and we'll look at these verses in just a moment, our attitude, our actions. They're all centered around the Christ, and nothing else will do. And then it explains in the last chapter about our love. Not only do we love believers, but we love outsiders too. So we're warned, we're exhorted, and we're reminded. And the beauty of it is, is when we recognize Christ as the head and why only he could satisfy the requirements of God the Father, he did satisfy those requirements. He bought the church. He bought the sinner so that we could be converted into his image. It is all centered around the sufficiency and the supremacy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the supreme Lord of the church and the world, the all-sufficient Savior in whom the fullness of deity dwells. We see that in chapter 1 and 2. Some favorite passages that uh, support what we've been saying in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 2, we we're reminded, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Don't be listened to the people. Listen to the words of the Christ. In uh, chapter 2, verse 6, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, notice he says Christ Jesus because it's the Christ, the role of the Christ that he's emphasizing here. And when he says the Lord, he's talking about Kyrios, so he's talking about the sovereign master king. Just as you receive Jesus as your sovereign master king because he is the Christ, then continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened into faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. It's a commandment of action for all of the redeemed. We're to be actively engaged. Set our minds on the things above, not on earthly things. In chapter 2, we're also reminded, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, meaning put off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done with the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, put off of the things of men, having been buried, it's already dead, your old earthly ways are already dead, with him in baptism, and then raised, already raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. The same one that raised him from the dead has raised you from deadly living. So when we look at the role of the Christ, Jesus as the Christ, um, it's, a, it's necessary we also understand the study in the book of Hebrews. God sent Jesus to become a man, a little lower than the angels, to live a perfect, sinless life. He was 100% man, but he did not inherit the nature of Adam. He said he was born of woman, and he did not inherit the sin nature of Adam because he had the heavenly father, not the earthly father. Christ the role of Christ meant God come in the form of man. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. He didn't have the sin nature. Therefore, he was not automatically guilty of the sin that had been passed down from Adam, the curse. And then he fulfilled that sinless life so that way he could become the perfect sacrifice. He had to become a man to become a sacrifice for man. And he had to become a man to be a priest to represent man. 
Now that's a wonderful study in Hebrews, but that is the necessary understanding of the role of the Christ. And if you don't have the perfect human sacrifice as your substitute, and if you don't have the perfect human priest as your representative in the courtroom in heaven, then exactly who is your representative and who is your substitute? And this is the role of the Christ. And by him doing that, then all enemies and everything in creation was put at his feet, and he is now the head of the church because of what he did. And that was his role of becoming the Christ. So we'll leave with this uh, last thought. Um, it refers to, uh, in 416, a lost letter uh, to Laodicea. Now, there's no definitive answer to that letter, and, and there are no known theological points associated with the letter that we are looking for. But many scholars believe that this is another letter written by Paul that was intended to be circulated to the churches in the region, as was Colossians. That's something that's interesting. The churches in the region, which we know for sure is the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Colossians, we, those letters were expected to be passed around between the churches for their edification. Of course, the Heavenly Father knew that it would become part of our Canaan that we would have in our hands too. But this is an interesting speculation that I think is worthy of being noted. Some hold to a theory that the letter that was lost uh, was actually our Ephesians, and it was just lost at that time. Okay, so... The oldest manuscripts do not contain the words in Ephesus in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Now, don't let that concern you. There's, there's other variants. That has, doesn't have anything to do with doctrine or theology, but it's just interesting that the oldest manuscripts, the Alexandrian manuscripts, do not include the phrase in Ephesus. Now that combined with the less than personal nature of the letter of Ephesians lend itself to a theory or to the idea of a circular shared letter for the churches in the region. And it's possible that the letter to the Ephesians that we'll study later um, actually could be this lost letter that he's referring to. Either way, we know that these letters were written for the, uh, this letter was written specifically to Colosh, but it was also intended to be shared with the other churches for the benefit and their edification of the theology that was going to be learned. So with those things said, I trust that this has been encouraging to you. Um, the letter to Colossians was an emphatic letter. Paul really got to the meat of the matter and said, get your facts straight. I taught you right whenever uh, I gave you instructions through Epaphras. Don't listen to a false teacher coming in with some new mystical higher learning education. I have given you what Jesus the Christ said. He is the head of your church. Look for no other sources of information pertaining to our God. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is our sacrifice. He is our priest. Christ is our head. And with that said, let us conclude with amen. Thank you.